these things we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 6. We have been uh, journeying through the Gospel of Luke in our uh, series entitled Investigating Jesus. And as we have been walking through this, we see that Jesus is establishing the new covenant. And we are moving from the old Mosaic covenant to the uh, new covenant that uh, Jesus is establishing there. And last week, we see that Jesus illustrated for us the, the heart of the new covenant. Jesus didn't necessarily teach, but he shared in what he did and the way that he acted and in, uh, in the circumstances that he was in to give us a picture of what this new covenant was about and the fact that this new covenant is centered around mankind. And so we saw last week, we kind of put a definition together, put it together this way. We saw that to God, people are much more important, listen now, than protecting religious rules. Uh, we saw last time, we saw the, the Pharisees wanting to make sure they held together all the religious rules of the Sabbath and all the religious rules that, that took place. They were judging everybody based upon those rules. And as Jesus did, uh, we are to look past the religious rules to meet people where they are and take God's grace to them. And so that's the, that's the whole heart of this new covenant that Jesus is establishing. And as he's establishing this, as we move forward today, we're moving into a passage of Scripture that, quite frankly, as you read it and, and you go through it, you're like, there's really not much here. Let's just read this and, and, and move on. It's the passage of Jesus calling his apostles, but I want to show you today that there's some huge significance to what is taking place here um, as uh, Jesus is building the foundation of something very spectacular and wonderful that affects us even today. But let me ask you this question, though, as we, as we begin. Have you ever been needed? Or let me put it to you this way. Let me rephrase that question. Doesn't it feel good to be needed? You ever been in those circles? I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful when someone actually needs you. Uh, a team is being put together, and the team is getting together, and, and uh, they, they choose you to be a part of the team. We learned that even as children, didn't we? Remember on the playground? They're putting their team together, whatever sport team or whatever, and they choose you, and that, that's exciting to be, uh, to be chosen a part of that. Or someone has a project that they're getting ready to do, and they realize you have some skills, a skill set that can help them in this, and so they ask you to help because they need your help uh, in this. Or maybe God brings the right man or the right woman into your life, right? And then they decide to choose you to, to marry them. You remember how exciting and wonderful that is because you are needed. You, need, you are needed for this relationship. Today, we are going to witness doing the Jesus, Jesus doing exactly the same thing and what this actually means in our lives. In Luke chapter 6, as we get ready to, to move into this passage of Scripture, Jesus is with his disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew uh, at this point. And they're on the move. They're moving uh, as they do uh, regularly. They're ministering wherever they go. And as always, as we've seen the pattern, whenever ever Jesus moves somewhere else to minister, what usually winds up being with him? A crowd of people, right? Everywhere Jesus goes, it's just been the staple of the ministry. Well, at this point, I need to explain to you and, and let you understand who makes up this Group Who makes up this crowd that follows Jesus? Because maybe you've never thought about this uh, before. There's three actual sections, if you will, to this group of people. There is the group of people that follow Jesus regularly. Did you know that within this crowd, there is a group of people that continually move around and follow Jesus? They are, and they include uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, but there are other men and other women that continue to go through. They're the disciples. Not just uh, these five, but there are others that continually travel around. They're called, they're referred to as the disciples, and we'll see that as we go on here. And then there's the Pharisees. Oh, the Pharisees are always there, aren't they? 
And so they're traveling around, they're trying to check out what's going on, they're on a mission now to, to get this Jesus, and everywhere Jesus turns now, the Pharisees um, are there, and they're ready to be a part of this crowd. And then there's new people that come continually, uh, bringing family members and stuff, and we'll see this break out as we go. But I want you to understand that as Jesus is ministering, as he's going around with uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew there, that there's other groups of people that continually follow. And so Jesus here, we meet Jesus again at the end of a day. He's just gotten done ministering as he does quite often. And when he is done ministering, he's tired and he, and he needs to relax and rest. And here's what Jesus does as his common verse number 12 says this. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. This is a pattern that we see Jesus do constantly. Every time Jesus, uh, it's, and seemingly it's always when Jesus gets done with a day of ministry, but every day was filled with ministry. He goes off to by himself uh, to a mountain place there, leaves his disciples, uh, leaves them off to, to rest or whatever they're going to do, and he gets away to go and pray, go to be with his Father. Well, why did he do this? Why does Jesus do this? Or why does Jesus go and pray. Maybe the question really should be is this, what is Jesus praying for? What is he praying about? There's really nothing here that tells us what Jesus is praying about, but in the context of all this, I surmise there's at least three things that Jesus is most definitely praying about that are vital for us today, and that is this. How many of you know that Jesus, first of all, is praying for spiritual strength? Ministry is tiring. As a matter of fact, at the end of our passage here, it's going to say that power goes out from Jesus. And, and as a result of that, he, there's, ministry is tiring, and, there, and he's being uh, weighed down by that or, or brought down by that or needing energy. And so he's praying for spiritual strength. He's, uh, it, it, we can encompass so much in this. He comes to the Father, and he shares with the Father. You ever think Jesus maybe came to the Father and shared some complaints? Oh, Probably. Some, some needs, some struggles that, that he might be dealing with as, as he's walking uh, through this. And he came to the Father for comfort. He brought, he, as, as we, we see in the scriptures, we brought his cares to the Father. And the Father took care of him and gave him spiritual strength. I think the second thing that we see here that Jesus prayed for is spiritual discernment. Uh, obviously, what is right, what, what he should do, how he should act, how he should react. And I think he does this mainly praying for discernment with the Pharisees, uh, quite honest. I mean, the Pharisees are throwing darts at him all the time. All, and, and how do I respond in, in the right way? Now, we know that Jesus was straightforward with the, with the Pharisees, wasn't he? He just kind of put them in their place, but he still needed discernment on how he was going to answer or, or, or deal with what the Pharisees give. And then, of course, I think spiritual wisdom. He asked for, what am I supposed to do? How am I, he, all, he, he never did anything unless the Father directed him to do it. So he came and he prayed for spiritual wisdom, especially at this point. So he's asking for discernment and in spiritual wisdom. I think he's also asking for uh, discernment and spiritual wisdom in another category because the next verse we're going to read here is we're going to see that he chooses his apostles. He chooses who these men are, and I'm, I'm very certain that he comes to the Father and brings these people before him, and we'll see that here in just a moment. But listen, Jesus goes through his day of ministry, comes to the conclusion of his day of ministry, and what does he do to help him recharge? He prays. Let's not blow over that real, real quick. We reread that. Jesus, oh, Jesus is off praying again. Jesus is off praying again. He's always off praying. Well, we, we understand that. We recognize that. But listen, we need to understand that the reason why Jesus was praying was because it was his power source. And listen, church, that's our power source. Prayer is key for us to, to do what God has called us to do. Because prayer is power, and we need to understand that. And so we'll see that as we go on here. But let's look at verse number 13. And when day came... When the morning came, after he spent time praying, he called his disciples. Now again, who were his disciples? He's calling a group of people that followed him on a regular basis. This included Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, but there were other men as well. He calls his disciples and chose from them 12. Chose from this group, these disciples that were there, and whom he named apostles. Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew his brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, 
Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, uh, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. How would you like that to be your title? Right? <laughs> Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, Jesus is making a very important distinction here that we need to see. And this is very important for us. He shows us the difference here between a disciple and an apostle. And he's using these terms very, very uh, uh, importantly to show us two distinct things. Now, we understand, we say this about the apostles, we understand that the first century apostles that ministered with Jesus was a unique ministry, and there are no apostles like there were ministering with Jesus. But the idea of the term apostle or the definition of apostle absolutely applies to us today, and I want to show you how. A disciple is known as this. A disciple is simply a follower. In other words, a disciple is a learner, one who comes around the master, who learns from the master, one who comes around and, and sits at the feet and learns from uh, someone else or learns from another person, in this case, Jesus. They followed him around. That's why these, these people were called disciples. They followed him. They learned from him. Uh, another word we could use is they were a consumer. So basically, they just took. They took what was given in their teachings. That's a follower. That's where we all begin. That's where we all need to begin. It's a great place to start. We need to, as we follow Jesus, we need to learn from him and learn what uh, he has for us. But an apostle, the word apostle literally means sent one. And an apostle, instead of a learner, is a minister. So we go from a follower to a minister. Uh, uh, one who is sent to do a task, one who is sent to do a work. Uh, or instead of a consumer, we go to a partner, one who partners in ministry and, and does the work. And so Jesus takes this group of disciples, people that were there, and he calls out his apostles. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever thought about this? Why did Jesus choose these men? Now, we already have five that we know he had. Peter, uh, uh, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew, and he chooses seven more. Why does he choose these men, or how does he know to choose these men? Well, first of all, I submit to you that he chose them because he knew them. He knew them. That's why I'm also sharing with you the idea that these disciples were continual followers. I don't know how well he knew them, but he at least knew them as an acquaintance. He at least knew them by name. He at least had an idea of, of who these men were. Uh, that they, because they had been a part of the group. He might have had some conversations with them. He might have spoken to them privately. I don't know. That's all speculation. But he at least has an idea of who these men are and has an acquaintance with them. The second reason why he chose this men is he prayed over them. You see, one of the things that he did was he says, I need to make a decision on who I'm going to choose. Father, I need your help. I need discernment. I need to know. And, and he and the Father can... can uh, conversed over this. And can I share this little side note with you? What a great lesson for us that when we have to make a decision in our life, the best place to go first is to our Heavenly Father, isn't it? You need to go to Him and seek Him and seek His will and seek what He's supposed to do. And Jesus went to the Father who gave Him wisdom. And the third thing which is so very important for us is this. And listen very carefully. He needed them. He needed them. He said, why would Jesus need anybody? But he did. He needed these men. Each man had a vital role in his ministry now and in the church in the future. So each man had a vital role to help Jesus in ministry now and, and were vital in what's going to come forward, uh, the church in the future. And I even put this little note down because we, we already talked about it, but even Judas Iscariot had a vital role, didn't he? And so, why did Jesus choose them? Because he knew them, he asked for discernment, the Father gave him discernment, and he needed these men to continue ministry. Let me say it this way, maybe you never thought about this, think about this for a minute, let this sink in just for a second, because you might, you might reject this right, right off, but listen, even Jesus could not do his ministry on his own. Think about that for a moment. Everywhere Jesus went, a crowd of people came, swarmed. I'm, I'm not talking spiritually, I'm talking physically. Jesus couldn't do his ministry alone. He had to have people help, and he chose these men to aid in his ministry. He poured his life into theirs so that they would be a help in his ministry now. And when the time came, they would be willing, ready, and able to carry on his work 
that would eventually become the church, you see. And so Jesus picked these men and chose these men because he knew them, but he sought God's discernment in who he was going to choose, and he needed them for ministry. And we see this exactly take place in verse number 17. He says this, And he, that's Jesus, came down with who? With them. Who's the them? These apostles that he just chose. These men who he chose for ministry. He came down with them and stood on a level place, and they went into ministry. With a great crowd of disciples, again the disciples, right? He came down, so he has the apostles with him, came down with the apostles. He's standing there. There's another group of disciples, other people that he didn't choose but have been following Jesus. And then we have the crowd of people that come from all the other areas, a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, and came here but came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So this huge group of new people show up. And then, of course, they don't mention the Pharisees, but how many of you know the Pharisees are there, <laughs> right? We ain't going to mention them, but they're there. They're there uh, right now in the midst of all of this. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out of him. Again, a, a reference to ministry and, and draining and stuff, and healed them all. The ministry immediately begins. He chooses these 12 uh, men uh, all together, and the ministry begins to happen. Now, I don't know what part these men played in this scenario of ministry. Maybe it was only crowd control, but you know how important that would have been? Because of what do they say here? They say, listen, these people were pressing in. They were trying to come to Jesus. They were, everybody was trying to touch him to be healed. and, and, and all. The, can you imagine the chaos if Jesus didn't at least have some people going, ho, ho. Hold on, we'll get, you'll get your turn, it'll be okay one at a time. Come, you know, it would have been overwhelming. And so that shows that even in crowd control, ministry is very, very important, right? See? Huge. And no one was left behind. But eventually we know that their ministry was going to expand because Jesus said these words in, in Mark's gospel. Mark recorded this, and he appointed, Jesus appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So we see here that Jesus chose these apostles to do ministry with him. Now, you say, what does this have to do with me? How does this play into into my life? What's so important? Okay, so Jesus called us his apostles. We know that. We've read that. What's the big deal? Well, maybe you've seen this, maybe you've not. Let me, let me point this out to you. We have just witnessed the building of the foundation of the church. You see that? We have, Jesus has just now laid the foundation of the church and what the church is going to be and what the church is going to do right here in the calling of the 12 apostles. He, he lays out a formula, if you will, or, or, or a, a, a way here that we are to do ministry, and he lays it out for us very plainly. And here's the thing. Since this time until now, nothing has changed. When God created the church, when Jesus put the church into plan, building the foundation here, guess what? That was plan A. You want to know what plan B was? No plan B. That's it. God doesn't need a plan B. He's like, I made the church. Here's the foundation of the church. And from this point on, this is what the church is going to do. This is what the church is going to be. This is where we go. Nothing changes. And so I want to show you three things very quickly here that we see out of this passage of Scripture here that applies to us today. It applied then, and it applies today. And the first one is this. Jesus still calls followers to be ministers. Jesus still calls followers to be ministers. Who's a follower? Well, all of us are followers of Jesus when we accept Him as our Lord and Savior. That's where we start. When we, by faith, repent of our sin, believe that Jesus died and rose again, and ask Him to come into our lives, we become followers of Jesus. We become the children of God and followers of Jesus. And that's where we start. But listen, that is not where we stay. Sure, we get saved, we come in, we learn, we need to grow, we need to, to, to listen to uh, Bible teaching and understand the Word of God and, and be followers. But listen, so many people as believers live their entire lives simply being followers, and that's not what Jesus wanted. Sure, we're followers all of our life, that doesn't, that doesn't end, but God, Jesus wants more for us. 
We are to be followers, but then we are to move to become ministers. And so how do we minister? There's two ways that, that we minister. Uh, the first way is here within the church. Every person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is given a spiritual gift by God. God has given you a spiritual gift and a, a ability, a talent on top of a spiritual gift that you have to be used in the church. God, well, listen, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you are saved and you do not plug into a ministry here, let me tell you, God wants you to plug into a ministry. There are plenty of ministries within our church, many, many things, many things that we want to do that we can't do because we need people to plug in uh, to be a part of that, and we're working towards that. But listen, if you desire to be a part uh, of our church and be plugged into a ministry, we have a place for you designed by God for you based upon the gifting that He has given you. The ex next thing is, is this, though. Not only do we have the, uh, the gifting to be in the church, but listen, we are to minister outside the church. We are to go outside the church. We, we call this being a grace point in our, in our community. We are to take God's grace to the community, to uh, those in our community and around uh, our state and around the world. We're to take the, the grace of God there. Listen, so many times throughout this the last 10 weeks or so, our building has been closed. But how many of you know the church has never been closed? And it will never be closed. They can close this building all they want. They can tear this building down if they want to. But this building isn't the church you are. You're the church. You are to take God's grace out to our community. Every time that you, uh, our church is mobile. <laughs> our church is where you live. Our church is where you go. Everywhere you go, everyone you're with, everything that you do, you're the one to take the grace of Jesus to them. You're that point at which God's grace flows out. So they can do whatever they want with this building, but we're going to be the church. And we're going to go out into our community, and we are going to share God's grace. As a matter of fact, pretty interesting, God is building the foundation of the church, but there's no building mentioned here, is there? <laughs> he's standing on a rock, actually, is what he's standing on as he's teaching. There's no building there. Um, the second thing is this, is every first, every follower is to be a minister, but listen, the next thing is the power of ministry is prayer. Everything that we do ministry-wise needs to be bathed in prayer. We need to be praying. So listen, we as leaders of, of this uh, church want you to know that, that we continually bring everything before God in prayer. When you are involved in ministry, you are to bring everything to God in prayer. And what should you pray for? Pray for strength, spiritual strength, just like Jesus did. God, I need your strength. I need your power. I need you to help me minister in the church and outside of the church. Give me the strength to take your grace. Give me the strength to do what you want me to do. Pray continually for spiritual strength. Pray for spiritual discernment. Lord, let me be able to listen to who's talking to me. Let me be able to listen to the situation. Let me know when to speak. Let me know when to input something here. And then pray for spiritual wisdom. Let me know what to say. Let me know how to say it. Let me know how to pour your grace into this world. Listen, we are living in a world that, quite frankly, is falling apart. We need to be praying for our world, but we need to be praying that God will strengthen us, give us discernment and spiritual wisdom so we know how to plug into our society and take that grace to our society. Every follower is a minister. The power of our ministry is prayer. And then ministry happens, listen now, when we work as one body. God has called us to be one body, to have one vision, to have one purpose. Now let me ask you this question. Where do we get this vision? Where do we get this purpose? Well, it's right here at the very foundation. You see, our vision... Our purpose was not made up by the leaders of this church. Our vision, our purpose is not something that we just came up with. Our vision, our purpose is the vision and purpose of Jesus Christ. We will align ourselves with the vision that Jesus has, with the vision that is given here 
We word our vision this way, that we exist to draw all people into an intimate relationship with Christ through the authority of the Word of God, producing an authentic community of believers that invest in reaching the lost. That's how we word our vision. But that is not our vision, that is Jesus' vision. We word it that way, but Jesus is the one that told us that He wants us to bring everyone, go out, make disciples, bring everyone into relationship with Jesus Christ. How do we do it? By taking the truth of God's Word that they most desperately need into their lives so that we grow as authentic believers that have a passion to continue doing this. That's Jesus' vision. And then we have the same purpose of what Jesus has. What is Jesus doing with these 12 men? He has chosen these 12 men. Why? So that he can pour into their lives, so that he can train them and teach them, so that ultimately they do ministry with him. But in the end, they start the church. They go out and continue the ministry that Jesus uh, begun. And so he's using them to grow them so they can go out and they can take his grace. We word it this way. That we are uh, committed to discipling members to become mature believers that are grace points, making a difference in their communities. That's how we word it. But the reality is, is that it's Jesus' purpose, not our purpose. We align with Jesus' purpose to build up our believers, to build up those who know Jesus Christ, to teach and to train so that when we go out in the world and the world says, I don't understand this, I don't know what you're talking about, we have an answer. Doesn't the Bible say always be ready and willing to give an answer for what you believe? Well, we want to build you up. We want you to know so that you can go out and when they ask the question, you can share God's grace wherever you go, with whoever you're with, with whatever you're doing in our communities. Why? Because the church isn't this building. The church is mobile. We need to go out and to do this. And then it all comes down to everyone doing their part and every part equally important. The disciples, I believe, the apostles, I think, most likely in that situation, were just crowd control. Sometimes you just need crowd control. Why? Because when you control the crowd, everybody can hear. When you control the crowd, everyone can get the message. When you control the crowd and you bring them in in an orderly fashion, they can come to Jesus. Then they went out and they preached. And they went out and did other, other things. But listen, every person is important. So can I sum this up this way? Can I sum this up for you? Listen very carefully. God has designed his church. And God has designed his ministry with you in mind. He designed his church. He designed his ministry with you in mind. God has chosen. This is amazing. God has chosen. We know God can do anything God wants to do. God can do anything uh, on His own. But God has chosen you and me to fulfill His ministry. Isn't that amazing? God has chosen. As He chose these 12 apostles, He has also chosen those of us who are in Christ to go and do the ministry that He has called us to do. You're important to the ministry. You are to be a minister. You are to be bathed in prayer. And you are to move out with the vision that Jesus has given us and the purpose that Jesus has given us. So can I sum this up in three simple words? And this is what God is saying. This is what Jesus is saying. This is so absolutely amazing. Listen now. You're needed. You are needed. Jesus needed the apostles for him to do his ministry. Jesus needs you. Because he's chosen to need you to fulfill the ministry that he has designed. We get to be a part of his ministry. That's amazing. But then on top of that, to think, Jesus needs me? Come on, Jesus needs me? Yeah. He's designed it that way. He says, I need you. You're my follower. You're to be a minister. Bathe it in prayer, follow my purpose, follow my vision, and I will use you, and I need you. I need you here in this building for our church. I need you out in the community, and doesn't our community desperately need Jesus? Amen. Would you stand with me in God's house this morning? Father God, what an amazing thought 
Now we know, Lord, that you are all-powerful. We know that there's nothing you can't do. And so the idea of you actually needing us is just more amazing than what we can ever imagine because it is your plan. It's what you chose. You chose to use us. And so, Lord, will we be willing? Will we be willing to heed your plan? Will we be willing to become ministers? Will we be willing to be bathed in prayer for strength and discernment and wisdom? And will we follow your uh, vision and your purpose, Lord, that we might be able to reach our community with your grace? Father, bless this week now. Watch over us and be with us and bring us back to worship you again next week. And we ask this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week.